Cheryl Bailey. Welcome to Coffee Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department. and Welcome to a special edition of our Coffee Talk. Um, today, we're with Cheryl Bailey. Hey, Cheryl Bailey. Hey there. Our senior coordinator, Ian Steed. Hey, all. And our coordinator, Ben Cody. Hey, Ben. Hi. And the four of us are here today to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to be a guitar principal at Berkeley. So for those of you who are in school here and you want to hear some of our perspectives on some of the opportunities for you, what you can think about before you pick your major, what we'd like you to be thinking about as you're picking your major uh, surrounding your guitar playing. And then for people who are interested in coming to Berkeley, if you have some questions about how things work, this is great, great hour for you. And uh, for those of you who are just kind of interested in what we do behind the curtain, it's some good stuff. So um, I'd like to start out. Um, what's important to know that's different about Berkeley um, that I think is really cool, um, different than other music schools, is that you come in as a guitar player, but you don't come in as a specific style in a track you have to stay in. So in a lot of schools, you come in as a jazz player, you come in as a classical player, and that's your track, and you go right down that track. And maybe you could deviate a little bit out of interest, but you stay right there. And at Berkeley, you come in as a guitar player, and then we have classes in every style. We value every style equally. And you can go as deep as you want, and you can go as broad as you want. We really suggest that you consider both things, that you consider depth and you consider breadth. So that means that you can come in and you can take lessons and classes in a variety of different styles. So that's the first thing to think about. The second thing to think about is that you're generally going to be in private lessons, ensembles, and classes called labs. So in the first semester when you come in, you're in your private lesson. We're going to talk about everything that entails in a minute. And then you're in an ensemble in which you're playing in a band with other people. As you move into the second semester, you add a course into that, into what they call the performance package, which is the lab class. And those are small group private lessons in a variety of topics. And I think we're running about 200 different labs this semester. So it's everything you can possibly imagine in a lab. It could be named after a person, like the Jimi Hendrix Lab or the Joni Mitchell Lab. It could be um, a conceptual, technical approach to something like spontaneous composition or modern writing ensemble. Um, there are all kinds of different ones. And some of them are one-hour labs, and some of them are two-hour department ensembles that happen right in the guitar department. And so this is a good way to start to build your own guitar education when you're here at Berkeley by the way that you decide to register and structure your lessons with your labs and your ensembles. Um, so let's kind of maybe break down each one of those things, I think, would be a good way to start. And I think one good way to start is to start with the private lesson. So Cheryl, you were a student here, and so was Ben, and so was Ian, and so in different times. And so always the core of lessons at Berkeley is something we call the proficiency. Or some of you know it as the final exam material. It's a vocabulary list that you have every semester that you perform at the end in a, in a final exam where two faculty members listen to you play and ask you questions. All of it is on the website, everything that you have to go through. And it's what we believe the core vocabulary is to know the fretboard of our instrument so that you can feel comfortable with the requirements of every style. And so these things are scales, modes, arpeggios, triads, four-part chords, and reading. And so, uh, Cheryl, I'm going to hand it off to you for a minute. And um, I wonder if you have some thoughts about the proficiency that, you know, just from your experience on both sides of it. Yeah, well, I think, or the way that I explain proficiency, the proficiency to the incoming students is that all of these mad scientists of the guitar <laughs> have gotten together. William Levitt, of course, and Larry Bayonne, and Mick Goodrick, and Randy Ruse, and Tim Miller, and John Bobone, and like all these just 
um, great guitars have gotten together and said that these skills that we're asking you to perform are, are what a guitarist needs, number one, to be proficient, two, to be professional, and three, to become an excellent guitarist, right? So it's, it, it's not just random stuff that people just say, hey, go play this scale three octaves, because whatever, you know what I mean? It, it's things that we use as professional guitarists that are not attached to a style. It's about musicianship and developing musicianship on your guitar. And, and things have changed maybe the, in some manner over the years from when I took the proficiency, but it was always about that. It was always about the standards that have been set over the years. And I like also that the test is given not, I mean, I, in t over 20 years of uh, teaching, maybe I've had my own student once or a handful of times, not even on the proficiency, because you just s sign up for a time. I think that that's a wonderful thing because the people listening to you are impartial completely. And they, you know, so it, to me, I often describe it as a true or false test, you know, like play me a G harmonic minor scale two octaves from the second degree, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, or play me this chord. It's a, it's a quantifiable fact. And so um, to have two people that you don't know, you know, check in with you to make sure you're, you know, as I say, dotting your I's and crossing your T's on that material, I think is really important part of the process too. But I, I'm curious what Ben and Ian have to say with their experience with the proficiency. Yeah, Ian, what about you? Because you um, played steel string styles, like flat picking styles, and um, what was your experience? Yeah, well, I played electric um, mostly my entire time as a student at Berkeley, um, and I was doing a lot more jazz at the time. Um, but I, you know, was a performance major, so I was uh, I went through one through eight, um, which was. I admit, like, uh, and I studied with a lot of people, but I admit that I, at the beginning, made the mistake of cramming the proficiency material to the very end, and I thought, you know, yeah, like, whatever, I already kind of know it, you know, and I would cram it, and I would do fine on the proficiency, but by the end, like, toward, like, a few semesters in, like, I really got it that it was like, no, this is, like, really hip stuff, and I started to really get into it. And um, my eighth semester, or my eight, level eight, I should say, I took uh, Mick Goodrick, and he had us doing it every single week. And it was excellent. Like, <laughs> I loved it. Like, you had to work on the proficiency material with him every week. And by the time I went into the, to take the final one, like, I signed up for, like, the earliest slot on the first day. And I remember it being, like, so easy compared and it was like the most complicated proficiency of all of them but because i had actually done the work of like really shedding it like every single day that whole semester just like a new key a new place on the neck you know a new way of doing the three octave like shifts or something and by the time i did the proficiency it was just like it felt really good to do it and a lot of the stuff that I feel like I worked on there have really shaped my playing in ways that like I, it, you know, I try not to take for granted, you know? Ben, what about you? What was your experience? Well, I only did uh, the first four levels of proficiency because I was a pro music major. Um, and uh, I think, you know, being, being a rock borderline metal player, um, you know, it, it definitely, it just makes you better. Um, and I think uh, it's fair to say, I think it, maybe a, a, a certain vibe of, of rock players, you know, I think a lot of rock players kind of have this attitude, um, you know, because rock's supposed to be rebellious, you know, supposed to be, you know, kind of the, the underdog, but it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to be told rules or, 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 you know, certain things with your playing. Um, but at the end of the day, music's music, you know, and, and learning the melodic minor scales or the harmonic major or all that, it just makes you better. And, and it really unlocks, um, you know, different, uh, different,
different ways to really be uh, proficient. I mean, that's why it's called the proficiency exams. Uh, and, and, and like Cheryl said, you know, professional, um, you know, on your instrument, you know, regardless of style, it just, it forces you sometimes to be out of your comfort zone. But, um, you know, it, it's really, uh, there, there's no, there's no style involved. There's no genre involved. It's just uh, musical knowledge that really is uh, something that, that again, like Cheryl said, makes you excellent, you know, kind of helps you really develop as an artist and, and, and as, you know, being, being able, you have the art side of it and then you have the craft side of it, I think, and it helps you develop both. I really like that perspective because you all did this in college and I did not do this in college because I went to classical guitar conservatories and we just approached really honestly approached scales and arpeggios more in just like a, it's like a physical, like a workout thing you know, like a technical exercise, like getting up and down the fretboard, moving from a technical standpoint. And um, I talk about this with Berta Rojas all the time, who also went through that method. There would be whole swaths of the fretboard that were somewhat mysterious to us, like not from a reading standpoint or where the notes are, but just in terms of like the way that things interconnect from just a harmonic and a melodic standpoint just with the nuts and bolts of like applied theory. You know, think that idea of music theory is really music fact. Like these things are on the fretboard and this is like a matrix. You can see it kind of come alive to you and you'll know where you are if you do this. And so coming to Berkeley and kind of having this experience of kind of coming in the other way, everything became easier. Like everything I was reading, memorizing music became so fast if I was memorizing repertoire because suddenly you have a name for things and you can recognize it in a different way. And so one thing, I, there are a couple things that I love about it, having not had it, um, that I don't take for granted. And one is that it really honestly asks you, what are your demonstrable skills on the fretboard? When you walk into the room with two other faculty, it's not just kind of what you understand. Like, I understand this is a mode. I understand these patterns link across the fretboard. It's like, can you play right now this mode of this scale at this tempo with a good tone and a confident sound in time? And that it's just asking you what you can do so that then when you go into a professional situation and that's required, you, you know if you can do it. You know, because you've had this experience of having to demonstrate things and you have this, this experience of knowing yourself well enough to know what you can demonstrate. So I love that part about it. And then the other part about it that I love is that I think some students see this as another test. Like you come out of high school and you're in this mode where you're like, okay, this is the test. And maybe some of this stuff will be applicable later. Like it's a chicken and the egg thing. Like this is the egg and we don't know if there will ever be a chicken maybe but this is like not that this is that like the chicken had a bunch of gigs and went on tour and played in a bunch of contexts and then came back and wrote this for you this is like the stuff that you use this isn't like stuff that you might use someday this is the stuff that everything is built of and if you think about it there's eight levels because there's eight semesters if you're a performance major like ian was you go through all eight others majors require Four. Some of them have an optional five and six that you can go through with the levels. Everything that's in there is part of everything we do. And all students have access to all of the materials from the moment you get a Berkeley ID. And so you can really take advantage of the fact that if you walked away from this school and you had that material in hand, you would have everything you need. And then you would look at the authenticities of the styles that you want to play and you would you would apply the stuff but you would already have the stuff um, and I think that is it's the most liberating thing really when you think about it if you can discipline yourself to practice it um, and Cheryl we just finished um, the draft of a book so that if you don't go to Berkeley you actually have access to some of this material yeah at books coming out uh, in January 2022 correct mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Press book. Yeah, it was an honor to work on it, having been uh, a student at Berkeley and been in the 
chair of the person taking the proficiency to actually work on the book. <laughs> Not the proficiency. That was a very cool moment. Yeah, so you can take a look, look for it. It'll come out with Berkeley Press. Um, and we spent some time, we spent about two years, I think, re looking through everything. We started this like right when Larry Bayonne was retiring and then I was transitioning into the chair and Cheryl was coming in. The three of us just went through every single thing just to, to see if everything was still relevant or did things need to be tweaked? Do we want to add some things? And so that book has a whole opening section about the history of the stuff. You know, like, where does it all come from? What were they thinking about when they wrote it? You know, how did things change from the 60s to the 90s when everything really was revamped? Because music had changed and what you all need, what we all need to do what we do has shifted. And then um, what are the things even from the moment you pick up the guitar and think about your sound and think about the fretboard from the first time, what are like the super fundamental things that maybe you take for granted? And let's go through those things. So it's a, an incredible resource and it's really as useful as you make it. And Kim, also is the title of the book, uh, Berkeley Guitar Theory, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Berkeley and also there's theory. some etudes, there are etudes that are based on each topic. So faculty have written things so so that you can see, see firsthand how, for instance, you know, I think Abby, Abby Aronson did uh, the modes of the major. She wrote a piece based on that. So there's mm -hmm. some real practical uh, applications of the stuff. Yeah, and in every style. So Jeffrey Lockhart wrote a groove tune. And these are things that people were doing already. And this is like, you know, okay, here's what this is built of that you've been practicing. So it really ranges all the way from like hard rock through jazz, through blues, through funk, through classical, through all kinds of approaches. So that's the idea. Um, so if you're listening to this, make sure you practice your proficiency. Learn from Ian and do it every day. You might not have Mick Goodrick sitting in front of you making you do it, but that seemed to set you off on a path, Ian, to take that upon yourself after working with Mick in that way. Well, he was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes that, that's good. Sometimes. But no, it was it was really good. I mean, yeah, working on the uh, proficiency stuff like every day, like really, mm -hmm. you know, especially when you get like the five through eight stuff, when you just start to do everything three octaves, and then it's like you have to think of every... Mm -hmm. um position at the same time kind of you know mm -hmm. and be able to sort of like float from one to the other um yeah that was really helpful and also i gotta say the the triad work and voice leading like spread triads so good mm -hmm. love that stuff <laughs> yeah it's really cool ian because i was just um communicating with mick this morning and we were going back and forth about different students of his that he was remembering and everyone that he remembers every time we've talked to them, every time they've come here, they really do talk about the proficiency materials. They really do. And, you know, people who have continued to study with him in their later years, just keeping coming back to him um, because that was this incarnation of the proficiency really started with Mick in the 90s. Um, when he came back to Berkeley after spending some time at NEC, he just kind of said, okay, like, let's really look at the fretboard in this way. And that's how his mind worked, was mapping it so that you could be free, right? That sometimes there's this myth that, like, when you work on this stuff, it locks you in and you're no longer free. But in reality, if you build this foundation, it gives you absolute freedom because you can see and hear where things are. So I think that's that's really cool way of looking at it. Yeah, and, and you know, you said you might not have, you know, uh, him specifically sitting across from you, but in studying the proficiencies, in a way, you kind of do. Right? You do. Yeah, I think that's beautiful, too. And I think he's starting to recognize that, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, your legacy is through this work. You really are sitting with Mick in a, in a different way. I think that's a cool thing. That's a cool way of thinking of it. I think that helps, too. I think it makes us all feel a little more tied together a little more connected when you're in your own practice room by yourself and um, and, and uh, thinking about this stuff because you know that there's thousands of other Berkeley guitarists out there thinking about this stuff, right? Hopefully. 
Um, so that's great. So that's the proficiency material. That's your private lesson with as many levels as it, it re is required for your major. And then as much time as you want to spend past that with the materials in the book and then on our website if you're a student here. Um, ensembles. So some people get very confused about ensemble. And there's two ways to do ensembles at Berkeley. You can do it through the ensemble department, which means you'll be in an ensemble with a band of people who play other instruments than you play. You can also take ensembles through the guitar department. We have several of them every semester, probably like 10 or 20 every semester, and they're called ENGT classes. Those count for ensemble credit. And then mostly, if not everyone in your class will be a guitar player. And so some of those um, include like Berta Rojas has like a, a Bach ensemble and they arrange fugues and inventions and, and those uh, all kinds of Bach repertoire. Um, the, the ones that I teach are modern writing ensemble and spontaneous composition ensemble. Um, we also have like just a rundown of guitar ensemble blues, guitar ensemble funk. There's a groove ensemble in the guitar department. Um, there's a Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed ensemble. So some of them are named after people. There's a Joni Mitchell ensemble, which goes through the ensemble department. So you just look at the little codes. If it's ENGT, it's with us in the guitar department. If it's EN anything else, it goes through the ensemble department. Um, and then those ensembles are connected to your ratings. And so I'm going to throw this over to Cheryl. And um, I just, I think it's a, uh, would be good to get your perspective on what's great about ensembles inside of the department and in the ensemble department. And then how do you think about the ratings, Cheryl? Yeah, well, I mean, I had to get have ratings when I was a Berkeley student and I came in, I didn't come in with sevens. <laughs> you know, I think some people get, the, the, it goes from one to eight and people get, I think they get hung up on that. And I, think the best way to look at your ratings as as a benchmark, um, especially when you're entering, it gives you a good perspective. I, and, I, and I, having been a professional guitarist for so long, I can't think of a time when you can get objective feedback on where you are. So, you know, whatever you come in like, so reading is, is one component, um, uh, rhythmic interpretation, instrumental skill and um uh did i say rhythmic yeah so oh so you have that and they're not in that order i think i think it's reading rhythmic interpretation improvisation and instrumental skill anyway it, it's really great for instance with your reading if you're coming in and say you have twos or threes and then you re-audition so you can re-audition at midterm and finals and um and then all of a sudden you're reading at fours or fives or your improv or or what you know it depends on where you're coming from. We have students who are, have improvised a lot, some who haven't, but you get to see that, that you're, that you're improving and growing all the time. And I think that's really important, particularly you're, you come to Berkeley because you want to get really good. So that's a great way to give you that perspective. And I know when I came in, by the time I left, I had sevens. I worked really hard to get that, to get in those ensembles. I didn't start there, but I got there. And I was, you know, so there's, they're your calling card to the best bands and, you know, have the, the highest ratings, but that doesn't mean also you can't get it. You know, you can always approach a teacher and if you go to a teacher and say, I'm going to work really hard and get in your ensemble. They'll usually let wave you in. And that can be a great experience. I, I that happened to me. I wanted to be in Ed Tomasi's ensemble. And I think at the time I had fives and we needed sevens. And then I did that. And then was actually after that, being in that ensemble pushed my playing up to such, such a higher level because you're playing with better players. Then I was able to re-audition and, and get my ratings up. So I think treat them as, as a guide to help you. Or, you know, you're, if you're, your improv numbers aren't so high, then that's a good cue. Like, wow, that's what I need to be practicing. So I think it, it, it's really beneficial um, when you use it that way. But the, the guitar ensembles don't necessarily rely on the ratings. Right. Um, so I think I, I just want to clarify for some people who might be a little unclear about ratings. When you come in in your first week, if you're here, you remember doing this, 
you play for a couple faculty members from the guitar department and the ensemble department, and then you come and talk to the chairs. And what they're doing is they're listening to you play your piece that you chose to play in your style, and then they're asking you some questions about reading, improvisation, and, and maybe some other things about your fretboard knowledge. And then they're rating you between numbers one through eight in the categories that Cheryl described. So reading, improvisation, instrumental skill, which is like your facility, how comfortable you are on the instrument, and then your rhythmic interpretation of things. And that's to give you a guide. It's just like Cheryl said, like there are different styles, as you know, that kind of value different things in, in not always the same order. Um, some styles, you have to be a really great reader of notation. Some it's chord charts some things like it's really based in your rhythmic interpretation other things it's like improvisation is a different thing if you're playing over changes versus not having to play over changes so it's always going to be a mixed bag but then what they're saying to you is like wherever you are stylistically here's where you are in the big scheme of things say you want to you're one style and you want to go oh i've always been interested in jazz how would i hang in an ensemble well they're going to let you know because each level has a certain list of criteria and some of that is style specific. So some of the higher ratings in certain categories are more jazz based or are based in, in a classical style, for example, for some kinds of reading, but maybe not other kinds of reading. And so you get a sense all the time, as Cheryl said, of where your objective level is for every style. And then as you pick the bands that you want to play, there's 450 different bands in the ensemble department. That's why we do this ratings thing as well. So then you can help place yourself. And then if there's something you desperately want to do and you feel like you can really work really hard to do it, you can talk to that teacher and get in there. In the guitar department, the way we do it is a little bit different. Um, there's some that are higher level, quote unquote, by reputation. There's some that are just like come with whatever rating you have and we tailor the class to the people in the class. And there's some that are called ENGT 340, which are independent study ensembles, where you put your band together and pick a teacher. And that teacher coaches your band in your repertoire where you are. So it's really trying to give you this big range of you can try something totally different with other guitar players at a style you might not feel as comfortable with or something really off the wall to you that's like, it sounds really cool but you don't know what to expect. I think most people walk into spontaneous composition don't know what we're gonna be doing and it's really fun to see um, what happens in there. Um, but you might walk into another ensemble and say like, I have never played the music of Joni Mitchell, but I love the arrangements. Would I be able to do it? And then that teacher can tell you, well, you know, if you can read at this level, then yes, you can hit all the marks on the chart so that you can feel expressive. So that's what it's there for. Um, and so the idea of the ensemble course offerings is that you can start to branch out or you can deepen or you can push yourself and have that experience of what it's like to be playing with other people at a high level. Um, Ian, what was your experience with ensembles? Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they were good. I mean, I took um, some pretty good uh, jazz ensembles. I, Took a bluegrass ensemble with Dave Hollander, which is a lot of fun. Um, ratings auditions were were uh, a little nerve wracking feeling, but uh, I encourage everybody to do it, no matter what you play. And also, people get freaked out about the sight reading part of it, but I actually found that the sight reading one was one of the easier ones to get up. To be honest with you, just because they continue to put new sight reading in front of you if you nail the last one and you can get like several numbers up if you if you play them right <laughs> you know what ian you said something really interesting because before like i hear you play now and i think of you as more of an acoustic oriented player but you're right like i remember when you were a student and you were playing jazz guitar electric guitar but was it through taking a lot of different ensembles that kind of opened up this avenue in your playing that wasn't there yeah i mean i was it was there but i didn't really like nurture it you know like that's the thing about berkeley is like you know 
so much of us have like this notion in our head about what we ought to be playing or what we, you know, and like uh, stylistically, like certain sort aspects. Like I remember it was, uh, I took a, a class actually with uh, Kim, you and Abby. And I remember like somebody else was like playing something that like, I associated this person as like just a straight classical guitar player. And like Abby was just like, yeah, well, we all have like our musical secret lives or something, you know? And <laughs> I think what's funny is like at Berkeley in a way, like it doesn't matter, like you can do any kind of music. So like I had always really loved bluegrass. I had listened to a lot of it, but I never really saw, like I didn't know how I related to it in a way in the same way that like coming to school for music, like that could almost be a part of it. And of course, like, taking some of that stuff here like kind of opened that up and then you know the Venn diagram of you know the jazz that I love and like the bluegrass that I love and you know, like a lot of other kinds of music that you play can kind of come together and um, you can really explore all of it here at Berkeley and a lot of it in the, the ensemble department which is cool. Ben your band your professional band is a lot of people you've met at Berkeley did was there some way that playing in ensembles like influenced that choice or the choices you made or how you met each other? Uh, not, not so much in that. Cause I, I actually, um, you know, I, I used to put up flyers saying, you know, drummer needed, you know, and, and, and that's, but um, it, it's funny cause uh, one of the ensembles that I did uh, in my later semesters was actually, um, uh, well, technically it was my drummer uh, in my band, Taka Nakamura, who was, uh, uh, a drum ensemble that he did but it was funny because we actually used the band members i had at the time and it was a directed studies ensemble i think it was it was like a 70s rock based um but we also had a keyboard player that wasn't in the band so it, it definitely kind of forced us a little bit out of our comfort zone and even though we were familiar with each other for the most part um you know kind of having a different perspective uh of um you know different song choices and and, and being able to work with a couple other musicians that we didn't normally have, you know, it was a great experience. But, but I remember when it comes to ensembles at Berkeley, my first semester, I was uh, placed into an R&B uh, ensemble of uh, the ensemble department. And at first, I mean, being a first first semester, I, I was kind of upset about it. I'm like, you know, being a rock player, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be an R&B. And I actually, uh, I think I even went to go see Larry Bayon, you know, the former guitar department chair, um, because back then I didn't really know, and you know I'm like you know can you put me another ensemble and you know obviously the answer was no at the time. But I I look back and that was probably one of my first really great experiences at Berkeley was being put in an ensemble outside of my my genre, because not only did it kind of force me to have to play a different style, um, it kind of forced everyone in the ensemble to kind of. Uh, molt together a little bit because I remember we ended up doing Beat It by Michael Jackson um, because Eddie Van Halen was the guitar player on the recording so that was kind of the the uh, uh, decision we made you know try to join join forces you know kind of compromise and um, we kind of had that approach with a lot of a, a lot of the song choices so it was kind of not only was I learning from them you know how to kind of play a different style I, I kind of felt like I was showing them how to Kind of play different styles as well so that kind of did a lot for me just just being uh you know around musicians of other of other styles that that early in, in my you know student career at berkeley and then after that i, I took uh norm zosher's fusion ensemble a couple times actually um which was you know kind of going from being in an ensemble you know that was kind of more of a traditional you know, you have a bass player, you have a drummer, you have singers, you have, you know, keyboard, and then being in an, an ensemble that's all guitar players. And that was a, a really great experience as well, because it made me look at the instrument a little bit different way um, and kind of how to uh, handle being in a different musical situation. And instead of, you know, being in a room with, a, you know, five or six of the guitar players, a lot of times it can turn into a wall of sound, you know, for, you know, and not in a good way, but being able to take it seriously and be able to work with, you know, guitar, a number of guitar players that you wouldn't normally be in, in that situation with and make it sound musical and make it sound, 
you know, really, really big and powerful. And that actually uh, directly <laughs> helped me when I came back to teach guitar sessions um, as a teacher because I had that experience, you know, seeing how Norm directed it and, and just work as, you know, a guitar orchestra, you know, and that directly, I already felt like I already knew how to handle that situation as a teacher for guitar sessions when, you know, I had, you know, seven or eight guitar students in a room trying to play, uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, Judas Priest and, and, and kind of, you know, classic hard rock songs and being able to do it in a way where it didn't sound like that wall of sound and making, making it sound really uh, big and, and open and uh, make it sound like we we're working as a unit and not just competing <laughs> with each other. Well, you know, that's interesting that you say that, Ben, because I think the guitar ensemble experience is really important because guitar players often don't get that experience like horn players do often. They play in a big band or they play where they have to blend together and listen to get. So, I mean, I've taught guitar ensembles and it was the first time, like you were saying, you ever had to play with a bunch of other guitars. And it makes you really think about your sound differently and play articulation. And, you know, are you, are you guys playing together as one or just mayhem, right? So I think that's the really cool thing about the a guitar ensembles. It does give you that experience of being an ensemble player with other guitar players. It's, it's an important skill. Yeah, and there there are two things that you said, Ben, that made me think. And one was that everything we're doing in these courses and is a segue to the discussion of labs, I'll put that in there too, is professional development on some level. And maybe in ways that you understand at the time and ways that you don't see at the time. So watching someone make an arrangement for seven guitars is something you may do in your life. You know, you're going to be in a situation where you have multiple instruments of the same sort of like timbre. Like, how are you going to work with that? Like within the range of timbre that's not as wide as when you have different instruments. Um, all of the stuff you had to do to adjust stylistically. Now it tells you something. You're a rock guitar player. You're in an R&B ensemble. What, what's different about the rhythmic feel of that situation? So that if you went into another situation in a studio or on recording or something and someone said i need you to shift into this kind of groove you would know how to do it now because you've done it and so i think that and likewise maybe all the other people who that was their straight up style now they kind of oh rock guitar players feel things differently they they think of things a little differently so i think that's important and then that in itself this idea of seeing things in a different way i think if you never try to do that you think that you can't and if you wait too long, don't, you know, don't wait, jump in and, and try something a little different so that you know that you can see things in a different way. So that you do know that you have core competencies, you have core skills from the proficiencies and your sound and your technique and they're transferable. I think it's really empowering. And that is kind of why we have this third prong of the guitar curriculum for all guitar principles, which is the lab program, which I think is the coolest thing because it gives you a chance to go like, right in the ground floor of something or come in at whatever level you feel comfortable of a, something totally different or something that deepens what you're doing. And so it's a small group lesson. It's a one hour course. And I was just pulling some of them up. You know, I said some of them before, but we have everything from like songwriting and finger style and groove and metal and hard rock. And you can just go on for days. There's hundreds of them that we have just so that everybody has that experience to you know you use it how you want to use the lab but it gives you a chance to maybe take a deep breath and go slowly through building a skill that deepens your skill set or broadens it and you get a chance to think about how you approach the instrument in that way um cheryl what do you think about the labs i think the lab <laughs> the lab program is ridiculous i mean i can't think of a place where you could go to get that many experiences i mean because the labs are really developed by each they're individual to the to the professor in what they're passionate about in their experience so 
I can't think of a place where you can go and get that close to people that are sharing expertise in that level and in a small group. And I think if you're, if you're into a topic already really deep, it's, it's great. And if you just want to dip your toe in the water, it's great, you know, because it's a small enough environment that, you know, all, all those experiences can be um, welcomed into the lab. But I think our lab, the lab, I mean, just looking at the variety of things that you can learn about to me is amazing. Yeah, and I like being a teacher of labs when people from radically different backgrounds than me take the lab. You know, and later I hear what they did with things. Like they took something from the lab and then I hear it, you know, in their music. And then I think, oh, wow. And someone will say like, oh, who's this? And I'm like, oh, that person took my class and it was incredible. And they're like, what? You know, how did that work? And it's it's great because you you can take things and, and just kind of run with them. And I think that's... That's such I had a, cool a similar thing. experience where um, I was playing in New York at a club in New York, and uh, on my break, a former student came up, and it'd been se several years since I saw him, and he said, "You know, when I took your bebop lines lab, it sounded like I was trying to decode some alien language, but I really stuck with it, and I took really good notes, and now I can actually play stuff." <laughs> I, I just got a kick out of it. Like, yeah, he came in and he, he was probably, you know, rock player that was curious and like, wow, what is this about? And then it, he got intrigued with it and, and uh, you know, then got immersed in it. So you never know. Yeah. And you never know what you're going to take from it. You know, like I have people write me and say, yeah, I thought about everything we did and this is what I came up with. And it's like totally different than anything I would play. And that I think I love the most about it because we are making these labs and, and the guitar ensembles fall into this category too. These are things that we love that we want everyone to experience if they want to. And then the, what people take from it becomes their own thing, which I think is so close to like, you know, our our lives and music is so much like that. That's how influence works. And so you get to experience that like in a classroom where you can actually sit and ask questions while you're being influenced and taking that stuff and you're playing. Um, Ian, what was the lab you remember? Do you, is there one that, I mean, I know there are many that stuck out, but is there one that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I took a couple of really awesome, uh, uh, chord soloing labs with uh, Jack Pezzanelli that was really neat. Uh, and that was, it was really intense because it was, he just like flooded you with all this like stuff, but he had such a way around like comping and using harmony to like really create like a colorful and sort of very musical way around it when I had been thinking about like just like, you know, drop two voicings, you know, other drop. Actually, here's one that's actually really good. Everybody should take guitar mini as well, uh, because that was a blast. Because then you retool all of your drop two voicings for other purposes, right? And like other drop twos that you're not really like, you know, um, would be like, you know, major seven flat five, you know, like that actually, if, you know, you play it like a D major seven flat five, you know, that's like an E seven with like a nine, you know what I mean? Like it's it and, and a 13, it's like hip stuff like that. And and it really gets you using other voicings that are really cool. Guitar mini was great. I love that. Everybody should take that. <laughs> ben, what was one that stuck out to you? Uh, actually the one that kind of changed the direction I was going a little bit as a student um, was Joe Musella's Joe Cetriani lab, which I know saying that probably doesn't sound like that much of a surprise that I was taking that because I'm a rock, but, but the way that it changed it was uh, up until that point, um, uh, the final exam for that lab was we had two options. We could either, uh, you know, perform a Joe Cetriani solo like note for note, or we could write and produce our own, uh, our own song using certain techniques um, 
which and I opted for for that one. And I don't remember exactly what what the specifications were. I think one was like you know, writing a verse where you're staying on the tonic, but you're changing the mode around it. Um, but that's what kind of got me into more of the writing and production side of it. Because up until that point, I mean, I was, you know, I was a performer. I, I mean, declare my major. This was, you know, early in, in my my uh, career as a student. But I, I was kind of more heading towards, you know, being a performance major. Um, you know, I was gigging all the time in my bands. That's kind of the direction I was going into. But just that experience of having to, you know, not only, you know, write uh, a certain way, but to be able to get to actually have to record it. That's kind of what made me go, you know what, this is kind of interesting. I think I might look into that. And that's ultimately, I think, what made me um, decide to become pro music and then uh, had emphases in songwriting and production and that. But it was, it was that that one lab that kind of offered, you know, a slightly different uh, variation of kind of what I was already uh, focusing on that made me kind of step back and go, you know what, I, I think I want to try, try a different direction um, even though it was, it was stylistically was kind of in my comfort zone. It was kind of pushing me to do other things out of my comfort zone, other than than being a player. Um, that, that was something that really, uh, I'll, I'll always remember that that experience. You know, as you both were talking, I, I had this memory of Melissa Henderson, who's a great rock player and a recent alum, and and was on our faculty for guitar sessions, and she took modern writing ensemble with uh, me and David Tronzo. And Melissa is this like burning rock guitar player. She's a killer rock guitar player. And in that class, like it was really remarkable to see her in there because it was at the, that particular incarnation of the class had a lot of jazz players in it and a lot of writers, like a lot of composers. And Melissa just like went so far out of her comfort zone and her sound just became giant. And she wrote these like super cool pieces that were like duo and solo. And then she would like create graphic score versions of the charts with like drawings and like, and then, and she just became like, it was so cool just to watch her playing like everything she did. Like, she's like, this is really out for me. I don't want to do here. And then she just kind of was like, oh, I could take this and I could take this and I could take this and do it in a different way. So it was fun being on the other side and watching someone have that experience that you both kind of had, just like be in a different environment and then find yourself in there, I think is really good. And and that's what obviously happened for that student who studied with you, Cheryl, in Bebop Lab. So that, that's really cool. I think now that we've kind of laid out all the three components, you can take a lot of labs, right? We encourage it because they're one credit. All the ensembles are one credit. The lessons are a credit. Now, you know, think about the way you're going to practice everything. You know, and as you're practicing everything, I think like if each of us could give a tip, break things down, I would say, go slow. Think about how your hands are moving. Think about how your body is feeling. Think about your sound and your tone and make sure you're breathing. And just think about the health of your hands as you're moving through things. Ask a lot of questions to your teachers about being relaxed, being fluent, having facility that doesn't involve tension. Because the last thing we want you all to do is hurt yourself as you're piling on it all of these different approaches and different things. Um, Cheryl, what is your advice to people who like find themselves in the middle of like, oh my gosh, I took like three labs and then I took an ensemble and now I'm in private lessons and like, how do I manage all this material and how do I do it in a healthy way? Wow, I mean, time management, I think is, I mean, learning it as a student, to me, anybody that you see that's successful is a master of that. I mean, whatever field that is, if they're an athlete or a musician or know your mom or your dad whatever um time management so learning about that how to it's sometimes it's not i think i think somebody goes oh i have to practice this for two hours when it if you took that two hours i, I find that with sight reading you go well i practiced for two hours if you, on saturday well if you just took that two hours and and chopped that up through the whole week and did it in smaller bits you, you'd have more 
concentrated time with it in a shorter period. So I think figuring that out, how all that goes together, because that's going to definitely translate to your professional life for sure. What about you, Ian? So I'd say uh, it, in terms of like the workload, if they're all playing, if they're all ensembles, labs, and private lessons, I think a good way of keeping all of it manageable is to connect them, right? Like to bring what you're doing in your ensemble and your lab into your teacher and apply what you're learning with your teacher into your lab and your ensemble. That way it's like part of one contained unit as opposed to like all this disparate stuff that you have to work on separately. That's good advice on every level because there will be connections there. It's inevitable. And I think that's great. Uh, what about you, Ben? I think more from like, like an artistic standpoint, I think it's great to try to find balance between uh, focusing, like going deeper on what, you know, your goal is as an artist and stylistically, but also pushing yourself out of your comfort zone too. Um, because I think that, that that was kind of something I struggled with a little bit was, you know, being a rock player, it's like, um, you know, do I focus on just rock? You know, do I try to, you know, how, how deep do I go into other styles? And it's a matter of, um, you know, finding balance between, you know, it, it's okay to focus on what you want to do and, and, you know, be able to think after Berkeley and professionally, you know, what, what uh, direction you want to go into artistically, but at the same time, keep in mind that you don't necessarily know what the future is going to hold. So you still have to be prepared um, and be able to be able to do other things. And it's just finding uh, kind of the, the, the balance between, you know, not necessarily trying to change yourself as an artist, but prepare yourself as a professional. I think that's great advice. And I think so, you know, swirling around that core performance core curriculum that they call it, are all these other opportunities to check things out. So, you know, now that we've come out of our remote time, we have something called the virtual campus. So you can go to YouTube and you can um, go check out some backing tracks and play along with them. You can check out our, our video version of the Coffee Talk series and just listen to different people from different backgrounds talk about what they do and what they learn and what influenced them. You can check out a lot of faculty playing. You can go to Instagram and check out student playing and little faculty lessons. You can get a lot of different perspectives that way and just kind of like all the clinics that we have had that have some video that we've dug up. You can go look, you can go just back and look through and kind of make your own little campus at home from that. And then we have guests coming, you know, as we start to have guests again, you know, everyone's welcome to come drop in, maybe go to a clinic or a master class of someone you haven't heard of before and come check that out and see what they have to say that you could learn just by looking at things from a different perspective. And then we have faculty concerts and there's student concerts all the time. And I think those are good things. See what your peers are doing. Go ahead and check out what's happening. Um, because I think that being in the mix here can really inspire you. And then in the moments where you feel insecure about it, it's, it's a good time to recenter yourself and you can do that on your own and with your friends, or you can do that by coming to the teachers or coming into the office, like come have a snack in the guitar office and, you know, recalibrate everything um, and refocus. So that's for everybody. That's every guitar principal, regardless of your major, we want you to have this core approach to you, you as an instrumentalist on the guitar, that instrument is a vehicle for you. So we would love if people got away from that feeling of, well, I don't feel as strong on the guitar because my strength is really writing or my strength is really production or my strength is in business. We want you to start to feel comfortable with yourself on your instrument. It is one of your first loves. It is an expression. It is a tool that's useful no matter what your professional focus is. And as Ben says, you never know going back and forth. And if it wasn't as strong of a foundation as you think other people might have had or you would want to have coming in, there's no reason why you can't build it to be strong and valuable when you're here. And I think the best thing is not to compare that and to try to just, it's a chance to kind of get over any insecurity you have with that. You don't really get over that kind of thing. You just start to get comfortable with it. You become comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
and you just sort of move through and, and use it as a valuable tool no matter where you feel like your level is. So we would love that for everybody. And, um, and I think it's a challenge to everyone. I, I don't think that you ever hit any kind of level of comfort or proficiency with the instrument where you stop feeling at some point that there's more to learn or, or that you wish that there are some things you could do. So um, I think it, it's a good opportunity to sort of let that stuff go. Um, and Cheryl, I wonder if you have an idea about that idea of like, well, I don't really need to do this because I'm going to major in something else or that's not my focus or, you know, what would you want for people who have of any kind of um, focus to have in the core proficiency of the instrument? Well, I mean, and Ben said that as well. You don't know what the profession is going to call on you. I mean, I, I could just say for myself as a Berkeley student, my goal was to develop my musicianship because I just wanted to be a full-time musician. I don't care if I was writing or arranging or playing country music or rock music or jazz. I didn't care about what the style was. So the bigger picture was about music and musicianship and I love music. So my time at Berkeley was, I was in working on my ears and working on my guitar and whatever, so that I could be ready for what and anything because that's all I wanted to do was just be a musician. It wasn't based on style. So I think sometimes, um, you know, I, I think that, that that would be my best advice if you're going to music school is work on the musician. Mm -hmm. The style will find you, the, the style will find you, <laughs> but you gotta yeah. have the, those skills together. I would also say to people who are thinking about, you know, production as their main bag or music business, you love music and that's why you're here at Berkeley. And there's a part of you that is that focus. And even if the person you play for mostly is you, developing your skills as a musician, not only does it feed your soul, which we all have to do, there's no doubt that we all have to feed our souls no matter what your focus is it really does enhance the way that you do everything. Like some of the great producers I've worked with, they have their, their ears developed in a certain way because they've played. And as, working as a producer, I feel like that helped me in the years I worked in the studio as a producer. And I think when you're, if you're in music business, the way you relate to people, for example, can really help. And so um, those are things to think about. And so as you pick your major, we would love for you to stay as involved in, in the guitar curriculum as you can. And we can find creative ways to do that and make connections, as Ian was saying, throughout all of the things that happen with your major. And if you're a performance major, you're going to be spending a lot of time with us. And uh, I think um, we've had a lot of coffee in this coffee talk. And so maybe what we could do at some point, um, Ian and Ben and Cheryl, is have another cup of coffee and talk about the performance major specifically and make that another special edition episode. Like, what do you guys think? Is that cool? Ian, what yeah, do you think? That sounds great, because I, yeah. I know there'll be, a lot of people have questions, and mm. so, you know, we can talk about it. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to say that I broke protocol a little bit. I have this great coffee cup. It's, it's, a, it's like a rocket ship, because at this point in the semester, I think we all need some rocket fuel, but I had a chai. I had chai today. I know. I did Tai Chi this morning, which you're is another thing. You're, you're losing it, Kim. I'm losing it a little bit. I had some breathing. I learned to breathe. I did some Tai Chi. I had a chai. What will the day, what will the day entail? We don't know. We, we don't know. Uh, ben, any thoughts before we hit it today and finish this coffee um, for guitar principals out there? Uh. Like I said, I think it's just about, um, you know, finding balance between, you know, who you are as an artist. I think there's two sides of it. I think there's the art and there's the craft, you know, and I think that they, they can be both separate and combined. And, you know, the art, I think, is the creative side and, and you know, where you want to go, you know, with, with writing and, and stylistically and all that, whereas the craft is, you know, can you play? Do you know your stuff? And uh, I think being at a music school, you're here to focus on the craft. You know, like Cheryl said, you know, focus on the musicianship. 
and then um, you know, you'll, you'll probably find find uh, the the artistic side on the way. Yeah, I think you're here at any level. Everyone who's listening to this in some ways is a guitar principal, right? You can't get around it um, because you love the guitar and it became a part of your life. And really learning the guitar is a lot about learning yourself. And um, it's not an easy process all the time, but it could be a really cool one. And that's kind of how we thought about it when we designed this um, was we keep it going, Cheryl and Ian and Ben and I, and as it was designed by all the folks before us who, who put a lot of thought into it. So um, I think that's it for us. Um, so I just wanna say thanks, Cheryl Bailey, assistant chair, thank you. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Ian. And um, everybody go practice. Come talk to us if you have questions, if you're a Berkeley student, and for everybody, we'll see you on the next Coffee Talk.